November 5th should have been a fun day because it was the Astroworld Festival, a giant music concert run by the crazy popular rapper Travis Scott. It was held at the site of an old Six Flags amusement park that was also called Astro World that had all of these rides and a Looney Tunes town. It was a kid-friendly place that families had come for generations to make all of these beautiful memories. And Travis said he wanted to bring back the happy nostalgia of this place, but things took a wrong turn. <laughs> As soon as Travis Scott started, the whole crowd started raging and sh Everybody just screaming, help, help. Your ribs are being crushed. So compressed. People were bleeding out of their mouths and their nose. They were literally turning them black and blue. I asked the security guard, I said, have you checked the pulse on this man? He said, I don't know how to do that. I was accepting my death. He just kept going, bro. That's scary. Stop this show. Stop this show. I just didn't, I just didn't hear that. They're dragging dead bodies out of the crowd. The thing is like, you know, people pass out, you know, things happen at concerts and it's not even just like a regular show. And maybe that was the problem because as Travis says, it's not a show until someone pass out. Whoa, whoa, whoa somebody passed out? Oh no, they can't survive? They can't survive? You either get on this stage of rage or take your motherfucking home, you understand? Travis Scott is the worst person I worked with in my entire career in music. Shane says Travis stole music from other artists and tried to use it as his own, that he used bots to fake streams and inflate his popularity online. His early followers could make an omelet because they were all eggs. And that he even left him for dead one night after he had a seizure. But before you're like, oh snap, he just spilled all the tea, you should know that Shane has a history of lying. Like the time he got his Twitter account shut down after he admitted to lying in a viral Twitter thread where he trolled the internet with this crazy fake story about a road trip and gang members and running for his life. So is Shane just thirsty again for the internet's attention? Or is what he's saying about Travis true? Was Travis willing to do anything to get successful and he didn't care who got hurt in the process? We're gonna get into it all, starting way back to see how Travis came up from a young artist to very quickly getting a deal with Kanye. You had a very quick ascent, like what ha like, I don't know, man, I guess it's like talent. We're gonna see whether Travis deserves to be called rap's stickiest fingered superstar. We're gonna look at how the tragedy at Astroworld unfolded and how it could have been prevented. There was a plan to storm the gates and I mentioned that to my superiors, but it seemed like it fell on deaf ears. We're digging into the festival operations plan. What city officials did? What Drake, Kylie, Travis did after the concert? What's gonna happen with the billions of dollars of lawsuits after Astroworld and how Travis is continuing to profit from this tragedy? We're gonna get into all of it, and so get your mugs out, cause we bout to guzzle, y'all. Hey y'all, it's Mary, and in this episode, we are talking about Travis Scott. And so let's start at the beginning. Travis Scott was born in Houston, Texas in 1991, and his real name is actually not Travis Scott, it is Jacques Webster II. Growing up, Travis's mom worked for Apple and his dad owned a business. And so when he was really young, while his parents were at work, he would stay with his grandma, who also lived in Houston, but she lived in a neighborhood called Sunnyside that was notorious for crime. Growing up, my grandmother stayed in the hood, so I seen some random crazy shit, mad bums and crazy spazzed out motherfuckers. I was always like, I gotta get the F out of this place. And eventually he does because when Travis gets older, his parents move to Missouri City, which is a suburb outside of Houston that is middle class. I'm from this place, it's probably like 10 minutes outside. It's called Missouri City. That's my room up there. I used to jump on this shit right here. And then I used to have to like, this is how I got my skills. That's where like it all went down, man. Like in my mom's house, my dad's house. It's like I had my room, I turned my bedroom into a full blown studio, like the bed everything man like I slept in a chair you know 
it's like real, you know? Even when Travis was a very young kid, he already loved music. He actually got his first drum set when he was three, and he said, I was playing drums extra hard. Like, I was not going to fail with that. After living with his parents, then Travis attends the University of Texas at San Antonio. But he doesn't stay there long because he drops out in his second year because he wants to fully focus on trying to make his music career happen. He says, every day in college was depressing because I wanted to be an artist. I'm trying to ice out my chain. I'm trying to rock crowds and have kids spaz. Is it true that your parents were sending you money for college thinking you were still in college and you were actually already in New York traveling toward a music career? Travis answers that yeah, that was true. His parents were sending him money for living expenses at college, like his books and food and rent, but he is spending that on his music career. So taxis, plane tickets, clothes, whatever. So Travis drops out of college and he moves to LA, but he doesn't tell his parents that. They still think that he's in college and he's taking their money for that. And so everything comes to light when they try to go visit him at school and he ain't there. Yeah, how'd that conversation go? Like once she found out that you were taking her money and spending it on all this other stuff. She didn't talk to me for like a good three months. You knew you was nah, wrong though, right? I wasn't wrong, man. Cause you know, it's, see, it's wrong in a, in a sense, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but then, to me, I felt like it was right just because I was spending it on things that was going to get me to like the level of just where I'm at now. <laughs> so here we already see that the end justifies the means for Travis. It's okay to lie and cheat and steal as long as it is getting you ahead in your career and it's getting you to the fame and fortune that you have today. But anyway, when Travis's parents find out that he has not been in college, he says that they cut off his phone the next day. They, they cut him off totally financially. I'm not, I, I was homeless at the time. Like, I had no crib, none of that. You were homeless or you were couch surfing? No, I was, like, homeless. Like, you were in the street? Yeah, in the street, like, in my friend's car. So, you didn't want to call your mom and be like, hey, I'm not? Oh, no, nah, man. I can't go home because I got too much to prove. It was, like, nuts. So while Travis is sleeping in his friend's car and crashing on his friend's couches, he says he's also grinding on his music. So he is working on tracks, he is uploading songs to the internet, and he's trying to get it heard by people in the music biz. And eventually he gets connected with one of Kanye West's producers named Anthony Kilhoffer. This idiot has his number and email on the internet. <laughs> he just reached out. I think it was actually his friend, Dozy. He was young at the time. This is like 2011. I just kept sending my music, and then like I met up with him in LA. I, I didn't even know he was flying out. He was, I think, lying to me, saying that he was in LA, but he was actually going to college in San Antonio. Man, I bought a ticket from Texas to LA to meet this for 20 minutes. So he came out here. We, we met for an afternoon. And he was like, my buddy's brother just got signed to the Dodgers. So we're going to be out here. And so with that, him and Tony Loney come out here. That got him to L.A., probably 19, 20 years old. My friend had like a crib in L.A. So I went there and we, we shared a room. But as soon as I got there, like I put out a video in New York. My first lovesick, it was called Lovesick. Right before we moved to L.A., he released the lovesick video. And then that was enough to start to try to get labels. Then when I got to L.A., um, as soon as I got off the plane, like just I had all these text messages and missed calls from T.I. Then I would spend more time in the studio. Then I was flying us to South by Southwest and trying to get him gigs, introducing him to all the people I know in the industry. You had a very quick ascent. Like, there are people who grind for years and years yeah, and man. years. Like, how did you get, what ha like? I don't know, man. I guess it's like talent, I guess. I don't know, man. Travis might say it was all talent, but if you ask this guy, he'll tell you it was a lot more than that. This is Shane Morris, and he says way back in the day, before barely anybody knew who Travis was, he helped kickstart his career. So long before this Astroworld tragedy happens, Shane apparently writes this blog post exposing what a bad dude Travis is. This is around 2012, which is the same year Travis signs with Kanye, and that's his first major label deal, and Shane ain't happy about it. You know what's really effed up about the whole Travis Scott situation? I effing found Travis Scott. He won't tell anybody that, but I was the guy who set him up with every single media outlet, everyone in hip hop, everyone in magazine land, free studio time, everything. So in 2009, when I met Travis Scott, I was running a site called earmilk.com with my friends Trey and Blake. 
Uh, and I was a junior level software engineer and I had just finished working for MySpace Music. So I worked in the technology side of music. And if we look at Shane's LinkedIn, it says that he was working for this music site called Ear Milk back at that time. And he's doing tech stuff like creating landing pages and setting up tracking analytics. And it also says he's a writer who is creating new posts for artists. So if this is accurate, then he would have some power to get new artists exposure, right? That would explain why Shane says Travis sends him music right after they meet. But Shane says he is not blown away by Travis's music. He writes, I told him exactly what it was, really bad, uncompressed, lacking in engineering, but really dang close to being special. He said they stayed in touch, that they talked on the phone every now and then, and that Shane gave Travis a lot of tips on how to make his music better. He says, when I started talking to Travis, he needed a lot of help. I guided him when no one else was around. So then Shane says 17 months go by and Travis sends him this song called That Crazy. And he's like, hold up, this is amazing, this is the song. And he wants to help Travis get attention. So he says he's posting it everywhere. He's contacting his friends at Virgin Records and saying, you know, this is the best thing ever. And of course he posts it where he works, this music publication called Ear Milk. He says, by the end of the first week, I have probably contacted a solid 50 big blogs, media outlets, and friends. I would tell anybody who would listen, Travis Scott is something special. He had the talent, but at the end of the day, he didn't know who to talk to. And if I really believe in you, I will introduce you to everyone in order to make you successful. I did that for Travis. So by this point in Shane's story, everything is going great. You know, Travis's career is on the rise. Shane is helping make that happen. And so these are good times, right? But then the story takes a turn. I think it's time to spill a little tea, as the kids on the internet say, and I don't mind doing this because Travis Scott is genuinely a horrible person. Travis was in LA sleeping on my couch. He was also sleeping on the couch of this girl, named her V, I forget, some other guy named Tommy down at USC. So anyway, he was coming to our recording studio uh, down in the dungeon. He was working with Ryan Rush, who was formerly a Panic! The Disco, Alex Greenwald from Phantom Planet, and Nelson London from The Stroke. So they're obviously all guitar players, hit songwriters in their own right. And so he was working on this song, Analog. Uh, they helped him complete Analog. And so then Travis had a meeting with T.I., right? And so he tried to get the bounce from T.I and I caught him trying to put it on the thumb drive so he could take it and claim it as his own. And I said, hey, my guy, you need to credit these three other people you worked with. That isn't just your song, you had help. Shane says, he came to my apartment in Beverly Hills and he started screaming at me and Will telling us, I've got a meeting with T.I. Shane, I need that bounce. I need to show it to T.I. I explained to him, that isn't your music. If you're taking that session in, you need to go with Nelson because he did the majority of the production on that. Then, according to Shane, Travis starts backpedaling and saying, I did that. Nelson just did some little stuff. That was all me. But Shane says he saw the whole thing take place, saying, I had watched Nelson do most of it, including playing guitar. And I just said to Travis, no, you need to leave. I was in my bathrobe eating fried chicken, so I propped my feet up on the table and I watched Travis stomp his feet like a child. So this is a big claim. And you know, this whole thing is written like a novel, right? We've got all the dialogue and the back and forth and Shane is really describing the scene and, and he's kind of indulging himself in, in making himself this gangster character. You know, he's sitting there in his bathrobe eating fried chicken while Travis has this temper tantrum. And so I want you to remember this style of writing because we're gonna come back to this later. But anyway, after Shane says that he sees Travis steal this music from his good friend Nelson, he says, I knew he wasn't someone I wanted to work with. But Shane does keep working with Travis, which is a little sus because it's like, if you thought Travis was such a bad dude, then why are you still working with him? But you know, Shane does say that he believes in Travis's music and he says he tries to get Travis to come up in music the right way by not stepping on other people. So then it might surprise you to find out that Shane says, he was the one that helped Travis cheat and use bots to fake streams and to fake his popularity online. I programmed a fleet of SoundCloud bots to artificially inflate his play counts on SoundCloud. This told record label executives that he was much more popular than he actually was. 
Shane elaborated on this site called Daily Dot, saying that back in the early 2010s, SoundCloud didn't really have a tight grip on their controls for limiting bot traffic. So it was easy for him to set up this system of bots to fake streams. He said he'd hire mechanical Turks, which are remote workers that you can hire on Amazon to do oftentimes tedious tasks, and they would create fake burner Gmail accounts to make it look like they were coming from real accounts. And this is how Shane says he was getting Travis 10 to 25,000 streams per day. We also did the same thing early on with Twitter. You may have noticed, and somebody made a joke about it, that his early followers could make an omelet because they were all eggs. We used software to enhance his visibility uh, via um, the wrong means. <laughs> and Shane says he did the same thing for Travis with Facebook. We created a lot of hype using more bots to share Facebook articles. Everything featuring Travis Scott was being shared thousands of times, but it really wasn't. We made Travis Scott look like the hottest underground rapper in the world, when in fact his real audience was a fraction of those numbers. Now, Shane also tells the site Daily Dot that this is a long-standing practice in the music industry, especially with newer artists, but also with more established ones. I mean, y'all may have heard about you know Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez trying to artificially inflate their streams or accusations of that, and so, you know, maybe he was like, this is par for the course, and he didn't think that faking streams was as bad as stealing music, but what Travis did next, Shane says, is what did cross the line. Shane says that he and Travis and a bunch of other people were all up late one night having a party, writing, and then I did what all epileptic people do from time to time, I had a seizure. You know what Travis Scott did? He left. He and his friend Tony left me. I eventually ended up in the hospital that night, but Travis couldn't be bothered. I should mention at this point that during the week before my seizure, Travis and I were discussing me managing him. For almost two years, I had been working with him, building him up, and giving him guidance and music. To get left like that when I'm having a medical emergency, that's pretty cold. So then the next day, Shane says he calls Travis and he says, Travis is like, I don't want a manager that could be having seizures. Like, I don't want to bring that around T.I., who, you know, is the big name rapper that Travis is signed with at the time. And that is when Shane says he exploded. If there's one thing you don't do, it's use my disability against me as a reason to say that I'm not worthy in my business. Travis Scott is the kind of person who discriminates based upon disability. He steals from the musicians around him. And then he manipulates people into thinking he did it all on his own. So when I was researching this video, I obviously looked up Shane Morris. As I'm doing that, I find this article, Shane Morris admits lying in viral Twitter thread, account shut down. And I'm like, this ain't the same dude. Like Shane Morris is a common name. And so this, this is not him. But then I'm looking at this pic and I'm like, you know, it's not impossible for it to be him. And then it does say he is a former Sony music employee. So then I reverse image search this picture and I find the photo on a domain called shanemorris.sucks. And I'm like, oh snap, these other pictures look like they could be him. And then I scroll down and I see this pic and I'm like, that looks like the same Shane Morris from the recent TikTok videos that I saw. So I go to his TikTok and I find a video with the same purple background with the wall of hats and that shiny grill on his teeth. So I'm like, this is the same dude. With that established, let's dig into this tea. Okay, so back in 2019, Shane creates this Twitter thread. Y'all wanna hear a story about the time I accidentally transported a brick of heroin from Los Angeles to Seattle? I bet. Shane says he and a friend bought an old van for a road trip, and then under the engine cover, they find this big brick that's wrapped in all this tin foil. So somebody was trying to smuggle drugs in this van. So next, Shane decides he knows what they're gonna do. He's gonna sell it, and he's gonna make some coins off it. So he hits up his friend who deals drugs, and he sells the friend the brick. After Shane says that he sells this brick of heroin, he also sells the van. He's gonna get rid of that. And now road trip's over, life's moving on, and a year goes by. And then all of a sudden he gets this phone call from somebody who is asking him to buy that van back. Not only does this guy want to buy the van back, he really wants to buy the van back. Of course, Shane's like, this dude doesn't really want the van. He wants the $40,000 worth of heroin that was being smuggled in it, right? And so this is where Shane says he decides he's gonna make a little more money. Even though Shane doesn't own the van at this point in the story, he says he knows who he sold it to and he can buy it back. And when I read that, I was like, I've never sold a car to somebody and then a year later at a moment's notice been like, I know I can buy that car back. 
Anyway, Shane says he tells the dude that's calling him, sure, I still own the van. And now he's flying across the country to rebuy the van back. He gets the van, but of course, under the engine hood is not gonna be the brick of heroin anymore because he sold it to his friend in Seattle. And so he's gotta figure out a way to get a fake replacement there. Shane says, I head to a Goodwill and I buy a medium size paperback book. It was the Pelican Brief. You know, at first impression, it feels like this is all a little too detailed to be fake, right? Now I'm bringing this up because when you read what Shane wrote about Travis and the way he writes it, and by the way, he wrote that expose post about Travis in 2012. He writes this whole fake viral Twitter thread in 2019. He wrote the thing about Travis before this, and this whole fake Twitter thread was only three years ago. Anyway, Shane has got this book and he wraps it in a bunch of tinfoil and then sticks it under the engine hood and he sells the van to these guys, goes back to his hotel, and wouldn't you know it, the drug smugglers, the people who just bought this van from him, are staying in the hotel room just below him at the Super 8. You know, the guys apparently open the brick, they find out that it's fake, they're furious, and they're yelling out, you know, we're gonna kill that guy. And as soon as he hears the door slam and he sees him drive off, he hops in his car, he's driving down the road, and his phone rings. Shane says he answered, hey, mother what's up? He's yelling, we've got a problem, you need to bring me my money right now. And this might be the only part of the story that is actually true. Shane says, I did what I do and I talk shit. I take it you're not a big fan of John Grisham novels. You should really give him a chance before you get angry. Damn! So obviously this is a really crazy story and Twitter eats it up. They got their spoons out and then, you know, the thread gets tweeted 68,000 times and then the media picks it up and it just goes totally viral. This is absolutely wild, tweeted a New York Times reporter. And Shane is loving all the attention. In one tweet, Morris showed that his thread had received 1.2 million impressions on Twitter, writing, this must be what it feels like to be a Kardashian. In light of all the positive feedback, I'm going to write a screenplay. Morris also claimed that he signed with a major Hollywood agent and that one of his favorite directors told him he wanted to turn the Twitter thread into a movie. Some people must have been asking too many questions about this thing. Eventually, Shane has to come clean. He reportedly writes a Medium post with this URL, I lied and made the whole thing up, now I'm in huge trouble, along with several tweets where it admits that everything is fake. I did it because I wanted to showcase my writing abilities and get attention. I'm just an opportunistic asshole with a brilliant imagination. But Shane told me that this whole viral story was actually a marketing stunt for a movie script that he was trying to promote. He sent me a document showing that this story had been registered as a script with a writer's guild, but it was dated after his original tweet thread. Now, when it comes to Travis though, Shane actually sent me images, multiple images of him with Travis. So it appears he at least worked with Travis in some way. Don't forget though that he did also have pictures of a van and him with the van, but that didn't mean the rest of that story was true, right? Now Shane also said he has a ton more documentation of his claims against Travis. I literally still have the first email Travis Scott sent me. So yeah, I have records of everything. But when I asked Shane for more evidence, he never replied. And so now we're gonna have to do our own little investigation into whether Shane's claims against Travis are legit. All right, so now that you know that Shane has this super shady past with lying and trolling online, does that mean that he is also lying about Travis? So first let's look at the claim that Travis is a music thief. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, Shane is definitely not the only one on the internet who is saying this. In fact, Travis has been referred to online as rap's stickiest fingered superstar. And it seems like this has just been his MO from the jump, like from the very beginning of his career. First, let's talk about Victoria Monet. She is a musician who is an especially talented songwriter. I don't know if anybody's ever heard a little song called Thank You Next by Ariana Grande, but she co-wrote that. So Victoria is giving an interview and she's talking about Travis and she's remembering when Travis Scott first moved to LA, he was actually living with her and another songwriter and record producer named Tommy Brown. Y'all remember earlier I said Travis was couch surfing when he first moved to LA because he got cut off by his family after they busted him for not going to college. And so he's there in LA trying to make his music career happen. And Victoria and Tommy were the generous people who were letting Travis stay on their couch, according to Victoria. So. That's cool, but then Victoria spills a little tea. She says, while Travis is living with them, he steals music and tries to pass it off as his own. She says, Travis took files from Tommy Brown and then took them to Kanye and said he produced them. He took a song that I had written the hook to and took it to Tiana Taylor for her to do and change it a little bit. Tommy ended up finding out because the footage was on his hard drive or something I can't quite remember, but 
he saw Travis in the studio trying to act like he made the beat. Victoria did go on to say, I know at his core, Travis is a good person and he just wanted to win, but that's what happened. A misunderstanding of him taking things to Kanye that he didn't really do. And I do want to point out that what Victoria is saying here lines up with what Shane was saying about where Travis was staying when he was couch surfing when he first moved to LA. Travis was in LA sleeping on my couch. He was also sleeping on the couch of this girl, named her V, I forget, some other guy named Tommy down at USC. And so that matches up, and that's a claim from Victoria about Travis stealing back in the day. But let's jump forward to 2018. Travis and a rapper called Quavo were accused of using vocals without permission from a Swedish rapper named Young Lean. Now, Young Lean works with a music producer named Young Good, who tweeted about this whole thing and basically confirmed it, saying, I don't mind Travis using the vocals, but the label never made any effort to ask or even inform about the part being on the song. Months of ignoring our reach outs didn't make anything better either. His lead major label just need to pay the people he collabs with. Next up in 2019, there was DJ Paul, who is the founder of 36 Mafia. That year, he files a copyright lawsuit against Travis for $20 million in damages because he says Travis used some of his song, Tear the Club Up, without permission. And not only did Travis use it, but Travis used it for his song, No Bystanders, which was part of this Grammy-nominated album, Astroworld. That case was eventually settled, so I'm assuming Travis had to pay DJ Paul something for this claim. Anyway, moving on, we're not done yet, because in 2020, we have another accusation against Travis for musical theft. So there's this guy named Benjamin Lasnier who is really big on Instagram. He's a music producer and he's got a huge following. Well, he says that the guitar refrain that is in Travis's hit song, Highest in the Room, which has made Travis over $20 million and has had crazy success on the charts. Well, Benjamin says that guitar refrain from that song was something that he wrote and he recorded and that Travis's team used it without permission, according to reports from TMZ. Now, TMZ also reports that a source close to Travis says, look, this is just a lawsuit that's frivolous. It's between producers. It's got nothing to do with Travis. But again, there are a lot of people who are making the same accusations that Travis tries to take credit for work that he really doesn't do, which it reminds me of somebody. Who does it remind me of? Oh yeah, it reminds me of Travis's girlfriend, Miss Kylie Jenner, who has had more than a few accusations against her that she's stolen somebody's idea and tried to pass it off as her own. This brand image for Kylie Cosmetics, for example, looks suspiciously similar to this very unique image that makeup artist Vlada Mua had posted before on her Insta. So does this image, which Kylie used for her lip kits, and Vlada had also posted that before. Oh, and let's not forget the time that Forbes accused Kylie Jenner of spinning a web of lies in an attempt to convince them that she was a billionaire and one of the richest self-made women in the world. Okay, now this next one is not straight up theft, but it came up during my research and it's just a story about Travis being a jerk. And so I thought y'all would wanna hear it. So there's this story where Travis kind of screws over T-Pain. So according to T-Pain, he and Travis were supposed to work together one month from the 14th through the 18th. They were supposed to work on songs during that time in the studio, but before they were working together, Travis had complained that the speakers were not loud enough for him and that T-Pain needed to get louder ones for Travis to do his thing. So T-Pain pays for these louder speakers and now it's the day that they're supposed to work together. And 14th came, he never showed up. So I was like, you know what? The first day, no big deal. 15th come, he didn't show up. This was on the 10th that he had me order these new speakers that I got to pay for daily on my budget. And it's like $540 a day for each speaker to be, cause they need to be loud enough for him to work with. So, you know, that's the 10th. 11, 12, 13, 14, he didn't show up. 15, he didn't show up. That's fine. 16, maybe he forgot. Can somebody call him? Boop, 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 boop. You know what I'm talking about? Just real quick. 17 comes around, nothing from Travis Scott's uh, team. But I'll tell you what, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, everything, fully active, whole time. Didn't skip a got beat. So, I mean, I mean, that was lame. If it were me, I'd be like, you ain't gonna disrespect me or my money like that. But T-Pain is way sweeter than I am. So he says, come on y'all, it ain't that serious. Me and Travis cool. Next, let's talk about Shane's claims that Travis faked his popularity online using bots to stream his music and make all these Twitter and Facebook posts blow up. 
I could not find any evidence online for this. I'm not saying that this is not true. I'm just saying I couldn't find any evidence for it. And I do wonder, you know, if it was so hard for Facebook and Twitter and all these tech giants to even detect this bot activity back in the day, then I don't know how others would have detected that these retweets, these streams were fake. And so I'm not sure how many other people would be able to have this whistleblower moment. Like, would there be evidence about it? I don't know. For me, this claim is a big question mark. Lastly, I wanna look at Shane's claim that Travis just used the people around him as pawns to get ahead in his music career. And, and he didn't care if they got hurt in the process, he just exploited them. And then when he was done with them, he would just drop them. Let's start with the time when Travis was sued by his ex-managers claiming that he didn't pay them the millions he owed them. Travis was working with LCAR Management, which is owned by this guy, Lior Cohen, who's worked with so many big names in the music industry. And Lior's agency says that Travis signed a three-year contract in 2014, which guaranteed them 15% of everything that Travis earned in entertainment. That should have earned them at least $2 million at the time they were suing, according to documents obtained by TMZ. TMZ goes on to say that the agency's problem was that Travis had not paid the $2 million. He had only paid about $37,000. The agency said it's made repeated efforts to get the dough from Travis since 2015, but all they got was a letter from Travis's attorney saying their services were no longer needed. Now, sources close to Travis told TMZ that he said he felt like he was managing his own career and that these managers were not lifting a finger for him. So he left for a better management company. Now, I don't know who's telling the truth here. I do know that there are people who want to be managers for artists and really they just want to be lazy and they want to get a nice big fat check and a cut of everything the artist does while the artist does all the hard work. You know, that happens. But at the same time, they're really excellent managers. And you know, if somebody's hustling and they're making your career blow up in a way that it never would have blown up without them, then you need to pay them. Like you don't just drop somebody when you're done with them. But these ex-managers are not the only ones who are saying Travis did this. But before we get into the next scenario, I just want to take a second to go back and let's look at what Shane said about how Travis uses people. So Shane wrote, we all saw Travis morph into this celebrity name dropping, ego driven a-hole. He's a thief, a liar, and he manipulates what he wants out of people until he's used them all up. There is no such thing as loyalty to Travis Scott. And I found another guy who says the same thing. Travis Scott exposed by a friend who writes Dear Travis Scott letter. This sounds like it should be an article about Shane Morris, but it comes from another person who also claims Travis used him to get ahead and then he dropped him when he was done with him. This Dear Travis Scott letter here is written by a guy named Lloyd Ellis. Back in 2010, Lloyd's in seventh grade and he joins Facebook. And what's the first thing you do when you join Facebook? You search for everybody you know. And so he does that and he finds his cousin, a guy named Tony Loney, and he friends him. So Lloyd and his cousin Tony are catching up and Tony is working in the music industry. And he's telling Lloyd about how he's managing this new rap duo called Travis and Jason, which was the duo group that Travis was first with before he became a solo artist. At this point, when Lloyd is talking to his cousin Tony and Tony tells him about Travis's music, Lloyd is one of the first people to hear it. Lloyd says, I was intrigued by their music and I decided to share it on my timeline not only once or twice, but I'd say at least a hundred times. So Lloyd says he becomes this evangelist for Travis's music and he starts sharing it with all his friends and none of them have ever heard of Travis before. I found this old tweet where somebody's talking about Lloyd putting the whole eighth grade onto Travis's music back in 2012. So Lloyd is sharing Travis's music online and as he's doing that, he looks on Facebook for a Facebook page for the rap group that Travis is in called Travis and Jason and he sees that they don't have one and so he decides he's gonna make one and then he tries to get people interested in it. He says, I would update his Facebook page on a regular basis as it was steadily generating thousands of likes. And Lloyd was also texting with Travis at the time who knew that Lloyd was doing this for him and who was telling Lloyd to keep going. Lloyd says that after a bunch of conversations and unreleased music hitting his inbox, we agreed that I'd help manage Travis and Jason's day-to-day -day necessities alongside Tony. 
So Lloyd says he emailed record labels trying to get them to sign Travis. He said he would spam the comment section of other artists' online accounts trying to get the fans of that artist to check out Travis's music. And so he is just like telling anybody who will listen about Travis's music. Lloyd also says he contacted major publications that covered hip hop, including The Source, Diamond Supply Co., Complex, and others. And Complex actually had this article with Travis, this interview that I kept referencing as I was researching this video. It's this long interview about how Travis got his start in music, and Lloyd says he is actually the one who helped make that article happen in the first place, and he's doing all of this, y'all, while he's in middle school at the time, which is kind of crazy. And there are all these screenshots in the article that seem to back up this claim that Lloyd has that he spread the word about Travis online. So here's somebody thanking Lloyd for helping them discover Travis. Here's a tweet saying that Travis Scott owed a lot of his success to Triller Lloyd and TTM, which stood for Triller Than Most, which was another name that Lloyd used online. I also found this other article called Balancing High School and Being a Top Hip Hop Publicist with Lloyd Ellis, which seems to back up Lloyd's claim that he was really making it happen for Travis even though he was so young, you know, he was in his early teens. Lloyd says, I was 14 at the time and I got the most done for Scott. But Lloyd says that one day he posts a video that's from another artist and he posts it on this Facebook page for Travis. You know, sometimes he would do that and Travis knew about it and Travis had just said, yo, just text me beforehand and, and I can give the okay. But Lloyd said that when he did that, Travis would never respond. And so Lloyd goes ahead and he posts this video by this other artist. But then Travis finds out later, according to Lloyd, and Lloyd says he calls him and he is furious. and. Lloyd says that Travis is like, you gotta take yourself off as the admin of this Facebook page ASAP and that Travis is threatening to f him up. Lloyd says, it's not every day where your idol threatens to f you up over some silly stuff. Now, I don't know exactly what Lloyd posted. I don't know what Travis said. I don't know if this screenshot is legit, but if it is, then I can kind of understand Travis getting mad and saying to Lloyd like, that wasn't cool, but to flip out like this and to threaten to f him up, like this is a kid who's been your ride or die, that doesn't seem cool. I will say that Travis was only 20 years old at the time, and so maybe this was just an immaturity thing, but the problem with that is that years later, he is still doing the same thing, and we're gonna get to this in a second, but he's still flipping out, overreacting, turning it into this physical thing and saying, threatening to f people up over, as Lloyd puts it, silly stuff. Anyway, back to what Lloyd wrote. He wraps up this letter, this open letter to Travis by reflecting back on his relationship with Travis and how it impacted him. So he writes, I look at myself in the mirror and I see kind of young teenager. And what Travis did to me left me in a state of shock. I had a strong passion of trying to help Travis out and I never seemed to get anything in return. I wasn't expecting money. I wasn't expecting shout outs, but a simple thank you would have been nice. As most people do when they receive fame and fortune, Travis Scott's fame and fortune impacted him. And I feel as if he forgot who supported him since day one. Travis was continuously padding his resume and unfortunately fame hit Travis hard and his egotistical ways managed to blast Tony and me out of the picture. I have no hatred towards Travis Scott. I just want him to open his eyes and notice who was there for him since day one. He took what I had to offer and ran with it. And now let's compare that to what Shane Morris said about Travis. Shane said, I heard this week Travis Scott signed a 360 deal with Kanye West for $870,000. Am I happy for him? Not at all. He might be one of the most purely talented producers and rappers in the industry, but he's a thief, a liar, and he manipulates what he wants out of people until he's used them all up. So Lloyd and Shane are essentially saying the same thing about Travis. And you know, at first when I was looking into Shane Morris's claims and I'm finding all these allegations of him lying and trolling in the past, I was like, what he's saying about Travis is obviously bullshit. I didn't believe it. And look, I still think he might be lying or at least stretching the truth because if you look back at what he originally wrote in 2012 about what his relationship was with Travis, he said, he came close to being his manager. And then in 2021, after Astroworld, this post resurfaces, all of the media jumps on it, and in the headlines, they have shortened things and they've said Travis's ex-manager. And now Shane is just rolling with that because now on TikTok in 2021, he's saying, I'm Travis Scott's former manager. So that's a little sus. But putting that aside, you know, like I said, at first I definitely thought that Shane was lying. But then as I'm researching and I'm trying to figure out if these claims are true, I'm seeing all these other people who are saying the same thing. And so 
You know, even the claim that Shane makes that he's the one that helps Travis first get exposure. So in Lloyd Ellis's letter, he actually says a couple things that support this. So he's talking about Travis's come up to fame and how he blew up. And he's talking about how that first single, that crazy, got discovered. And he says, someone referenced that after that crazy got released, everything was golden and that it was published on Ear Milk, the first big blog to discover it. And Lloyd also includes a screenshot of Travis messaging him a link to that blog post on Ear Milk the day that it came out. And remember, Ear Milk is the music blog where Shane was working and where he says he first posted this song by Travis, that crazy that got all this attention. And so this supports what Shane was saying back in 2012, which was actually a year before this letter from Lloyd comes out saying a lot of the same things about Travis. It's possible that both of these guys really helped Travis, that Lloyd was slaying the best he could as a teenager in high school, which honestly was better than what most adults could do. But then you've got Shane, who is a little older and a little more connected in the music industry, who could have also been helping Travis. And so if what both of them are saying is true, then both Lloyd and Shane played a really big role in helping Travis get to where he is today. And again, if Shane and Lloyd are telling the truth, then both of them were also dropped when they weren't needed anymore in really messed up ways. If you're enjoying this video, I'd be so grateful if you gave it a like. Boop, 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 boop. And if you want to support me in making more videos like this spilling the tea on shady money makers, then you can get the official guzzle mug at marybetsy.com backslash merch. And you can save 10% in the next 48 hours using the code thirsty. All right, let's get back to the tea. All right, by now you've heard a lot of claims alleging what kind of guy Travis Scott is and what his character has been as he's come up in his music career. But now it's time to shift our focus to what his concerts are like. Travis's Astroworld Concert Festival in 2021 turned out to be one of the deadliest shows in history. So why was that? You know, was it just a freak tragic accident? Had people just been cooped up for too long with COVID and they wanted to wild out and then things got out of control? Or was this tragedy in the making for a long time? Were there warning signs at Travis's other concerts? Were there out of control crowds or people getting hurt at his past concerts? And if so, what did Travis do to discourage that or to incite it? Well, let's get into it. First off, let me be clear, Travis's concerts were known for being out of control. That's why you see articles titled, I Tried Not to Die at the Travis Scott Show Last Night, and YouTube videos titled, Inside a Mosh Pit at a Travis Scott Concert Near Death. This chaos is what Travis was known for. Before the Astroworld tragedy, Travis Scott's raging is what made him a star. People loved this about his show. It was his signature. They thought this is what made him a musical legend. Rolling Stone called it the greatest show in the world, comparing Mr. Scott's unhinged leaping to Michael Jackson's moonwalking, while the Washington Post crowned the rapper one of the most electrifying performers of the moment, saying he was a maestro directing the chaos. Just seeing them be able for like, what, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, however much time I got, you know, lose their mind, man. Travis said that since he was six years old, he always wanted to be a wrestler. And so his performances, he always wanted to make them feel like they were the WWF. Oh my God! <laughs> Travis Scott's fans are called ragers. They're the ones that are wilding out in the mosh pit, losing control. And if you ain't raging at his concert, he will not hesitate to call you out. These motherfuckers right here, they are called ragers. Y'all over there, y'all are called scared motherfuckers. Turn and look at these scared motherfuckers and let me get a loud fuck you on the count of three. One, two, three, fuck you! If you go to his show and you stand still, you are a bystander and Travis does not want that. We don't want you standing around like this is a no stand zone. I don't want to see nobody on the outskirts chilling. This is not a peace show. If you want to watch, go get a burger. If you want to have fun, get the pit. Travis Scott does not like bystanders. Okay? Hey, yo, listen, son. This is not no motherfucking 
ballet. This ain't no runway. This ain't no motherfucking dance show. You either get on this stage of rage or take your motherfucking home, you understand? If you're scared, the ex is right there. Travis Scott's whole aesthetic is about rebellion. Travis wants and he will demand mayhem at his concerts. And if security tries to get in the way of that, he will step in and prevent security from doing their job, which is to keep his fans safe. Hey, hey, hey. All you security motherfuckers, listen. If a motherfucker crowd surf, you let them. If they fall out, you put them back in there. If you keep them out, all these motherfuckers gonna jump your Hey, yo, security. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Nothing shows Travis's anti-security ways quite like his performance or his attempted performance at the Lollapalooza Festival in 2015. So Travis comes on stage and he starts amping up the crowd and then fans start climbing over the security barricades toward the stage. So security starts to intervene and Travis yells at them to stop. And so the crowd is totally out of control by this point and security and event staff are trying to get a hold of the situation so that it doesn't get dangerous, but Travis keeps stopping them from doing that. So now everybody's climbing on the stage and things are a total hot mess by this point. And this is where Travis decides, now I need to pull back. I need to try to control this chaos that I just created. But by this point, you know, the crowd's off the chain. Yo, one ranger at a time. Down, down, down. Look at this kid over here just trying to get his selfie in and flex to his friends on Instagram. You know, these kids are just having the time of their lives right now. And Travis is acting like the substitute teacher who's trying to get all the students to go back to their seats. And he's angry and yelling. And look at this kid, I bet he's like, you told me two seconds ago to rage, Travis. And of course, when security tries to get people under control, it doesn't go well. And then I guess somebody tells Travis, look, we're, we're gonna have to pull the plug. Like, we're gonna have to end this whole thing. And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's fine. Like, it's cool. We can start over. It's all good. We can start over. We can start over. Everybody just get down. Everybody just get down. You know, this, this was just a little hiccup. It's fine. It's good, it's good, it's good. But it wasn't fine because his show gets shut down about five minutes after he starts and all that rage that travis wanted resulted in a stampede that trampled a 15 year old girl according to the new york times now what does travis do he ends up leaving he flees the scene but he is later arrested on charges of reckless conduct and he ends up pleading guilty to that according to rolling stone a judge orders travis to remain under court supervision for a year I don't know exactly what that means, but after this whole situation, Travis does post on Instagram saying, thank you Lollapalooza, learned a lot from this. I don't know what exactly he learned because his actions after this do not look like the actions of somebody who learned to prioritize the safety of their fans. I do wonder, and this is pure speculation on my part, I don't know, but I wonder, was he paid for this? Was he paid for this concert that had to get cut short because of this out of control crowd that he ended up causing and was actually arrested for. I would bet there is a clause somewhere in that contract that says you can't do what you did. You can't tell security not to do their jobs. And you know, if I was the one who hired Travis, like I wouldn't pay him. I don't see how he could fulfill his obligation in that contract to perform when it was his actions that shut the show down. But ultimately, I don't know if he got paid or not, but it does make me wonder that if he didn't, you know, is that the lesson that he learned that no matter what, I'm not gonna stop performing. No matter how crazy things get, I cannot end my show early because then I don't get paid and I wanna get my paycheck. Next up, let's talk about the time that Travis absolutely, totally loses his on a fan for allegedly trying to steal his shoe. So here's the deal. Travis is performing in 2017 in Switzerland at a concert, and then he stage dives into the crowd and he's crowd surfing and everybody's having fun and it's all good. And then 
all of a sudden everything changes and he stops the show because he thinks somebody in the audience tried to steal his Yeezy shoe. You tried to take my shoe? You wanna be a thief? Come up, come up, come up. When Travis started telling the whole crowd to chant him up and was encouraging them to do that, that is where I was like, this went too far. You have a massive crowd of people who worship you and you should know as a performer, you should know as a celebrity that if you tell that crowd to somebody up, they really could get up, that they could get seriously injured or even killed. And is your Yeezy shoe really worth that? Is it worth somebody dying for or getting seriously hurt? Like, how much are you getting paid right now for this show? Like, you can afford another shoe, bro. Not to mention, to me, I mean, I wasn't there. I know that there was a lot of commotion, but like, it didn't even look like he tried to steal your shoe. Simply put, crowds are sheep. It is up to the leaders to control them, which in these cases are the artists or the bands. And I think it's clear Travis knows that he has control over the crowd and he can make them go totally wild. And I think he loves showing that power, even if people are getting hurt in the process. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. And as the event staff escort this kid away, Travis spits on them on the way out. And y'all, I want you to notice this person is young. This is a kid. I mean, this dude cannot be older than a teenager and he's not that big in size. So this situation could have been way worse. And I, I really think this comment says it all. Travis stops a concert for a shoe, but not for a bunch of people dying. Next up, let's talk about Kyle Green, who says he became paralyzed at a Travis Scott show after he fell over a balcony. During a concert in New York back in 2017, Travis puts the spotlight on a fan who acts like they're gonna jump from the second story balcony. Turn the lights on. I see you, bro. You gonna do it. Now that is not the guy who claims he was paralyzed after falling from a balcony at this concert, and neither is this girl, because there were actually a handful of people at this concert who jumped from the balcony. It is reported that after this happens, after Travis encourages this fan to jump from the balcony, another guy named Kyle Green is watching the show. He's at the concert, same night, everything. The crowd is so out of control that he gets pushed off of the third story balcony. And when he falls, he gets seriously injured. So TMZ posted this video that it claims shows Kyle Green going over the balcony. And I am sorry, y'all, these are not my ugly graphics, but you can also see that this is a very blurry situation and we've got strobe lights going off. And so I think it's kind of hard to tell exactly who this is, but I did find on YouTube another video that appears to show this same dude but from a different angle. And you might be watching these videos thinking, it looks like Kyle jumped from the balcony, but really there is so much movement going on. And things are so fuzzy. For me, it's hard to tell exactly what happened. Also, everybody says that Kyle went over the third story balcony, but to me, it looks like this dude in this video went over the second story. That seems very obvious. And I found a comment from someone who says they were there at this concert and that they saw the kid that supposedly broke his legs jump from the second story as well, but he just came flying out of nowhere. And you can see that. You can see that this dude was not like that other girl who was down there pointing to somebody in the crowd like, you got me, and they're like, I got you, before she jumps. And it wasn't like that other dude who kind of like climbs down and then dangles himself so he don't have that far to go. No, this seems very sudden, like somebody either catapulted themselves over the railing or they were pushed from behind by surprise. But anyway, whatever happened, what we do know is that Kyle had a hard fall to the floor. That person from the third story, that jumped from the third story, somebody help them get out, please. They legs broke? Hey, whoever you are, I owe you a chain. You just sacrifice your limbs, but I don't know why you do that. But I love you so much. Everybody make some noise for that real motherfucker right there. Ray, get that pick. Get that pick right there, Ray. You're a savage. That's my Come here. Come here. Take this ring. Hey, pick him up. Pick his up. Pick this ring. Go ahead, put this ring on him. Pick him up, man. No, wait, wait. How the f did you do that? I love you, man. You didn't do it? Huh? 
What? That ring was reportedly worth $100,000. And a source also told TMZ that Kyle was visited in the hospital by Travis's team and that Travis FaceTimed with Kyle after the show. So based on those reports, it seemed like there was love between Kyle and Travis after this incident. TMZ also says that it obtained an email that was written by Kyle's mom to Travis after this incident happens and that she writes that her son Kyle does not hold either of you accountable for what happened to him and he will not take any legal action against you. I would never punish someone who was trying to help my son. Kyle has said that he will never forget your kindness and encouragement during that terrifying time. Now, whether or not that email is legit, I don't know. You know, this is a story from TMZ and they did not include a copy of that email. But what we do know is that ultimately, Kyle does end up suing Travis for this incident. Kyle's attorneys say that after he fell, they say Kyle was in tremendous pain, but he was lifted up, pulled around, and dropped in front of the stage without using any backboard or neck brace. He's grabbing the leg. They say he was only given basic first aid, but if he had been given the right care, he would not have wound up paralyzed and bound to a wheelchair like he is now. Now, as far as Travis's response to this lawsuit, a spokesperson for him says, Travis only encouraged fans to jump from the second story balcony and not the third story balcony, which is where Kyle Green allegedly fell from, but I don't think that makes things better. It's not like encouraging people to jump from a balcony, whether it's the second story or the third story, like both of those things are dangerous. Both of those things put your fans' safety at risk. It's like saying, you know, I told you just to juggle two knives. I didn't tell you to juggle three knives, and so, you know, don't blame me if you got hurt. It's kind of a weird defense. Now, I'm curious what y'all think, who's at fault in this situation, because people on YouTube had some different opinions. So Vanity Fair 001 says, I don't know if Travis can be held responsible for people who chose to attend a concert and then jump off of a balcony because he told me to. If you get hurt from jumping off a balcony, it's your own fault for behaving stupidly. But Nara Nora says, the thing is, he is like a guide to these people. Young, dumb people who worship you are impressionable. They idolize you and would do anything for your praise and attention and when you know this you shouldn't say stuff that can hurt them he did push them with his words travis's team also said the safety of everyone is held in the highest regard and we are conducting an internal investigation to ensure that this does not happen again but obviously that was not ensured going forward because about two weeks later another one of travis's concerts gets out of control so Travis was performing in 2017 at a concert in Arkansas. And as his set is coming to a close, he takes a second to talk to the audience and say, this is your last chance to get in the mosh pit if you want to. I'm gonna invite just a couple more people down here to raise with these motherfuckers right here. Now, I don't know. I don't know if you're scared. I don't know if you're nervous. I don't know what it is. But if you want to get in this pit, this is your last chance right now. Oh, here they come. Ray, Tyler, get it. Travis was charged with something called suspicion of inciting a riot. And because people were injured in this incident, that means this charge becomes a felony in the state of Arkansas. But, but Travis avoided a felony charge because he was offered a plea deal. And so he only had to plead guilty to a misdemeanor of disorderly conduct, and he only had to pay a fine of under 7,500 bucks. And that don't hurt him. Let's just look at what Travis allegedly makes in one of his brand deals. $7,500 ain't nothing to a celebrity like Travis. I think that's a shame because I mean, look, I, I know and I, I respect that there's a high burden of proof when it comes to convicting somebody in the United States of a crime and there should be. And so I get that prosecutors may have had a difficult time proving that he was inciting a riot, especially when Travis can afford the best attorneys in the world, right? And I understand why plea deals are offered in more difficult cases because the prosecutors want to make sure that at least some punishment is inflicted and they don't have to take a gamble with the jury and this is a sure bet, but $7,500 is not a punishment for Travis, it just ain't. The negative attention is punishment for Travis. So when the media covers the fact that people got injured in this because Travis told security not to do their job, that is punishment. That makes parents wanna say, I'm not buying a ticket for my kid to go to that concert. That makes people who are fans of his say, 
I, you know, I think I'm just gonna listen to his music online because I ain't trying to get trampled. That makes venues say it's not worth the liability booking this dude. And all of that is gonna hurt him way more than 7,500 bucks. And so even if the prosecutor took this case to court and they lost, I feel like just the media coverage alone would have been a much bigger punishment for Travis. You know, it would say that we as a society, we ain't gonna tolerate performers and celebrities just being reckless when it comes to their fan safety because there's just too much on the line. We have people's lives at risk. We have the possibility that people could get really seriously injured, people's health at risk. And what's at risk for the celebrity? 7,500 bucks? That's nowhere near the same level of risk. And it should be. A performer like Travis should want to make sure that nobody gets hurt at one of their shows. But for Travis, the opposite is true. He expects fans are gonna get hurt at his concerts. That's the point. It's not a show until someone passes out. And so when someone does pass out at Travis's concerts, that's routine. Whoa, whoa, whoa somebody passed out? Somebody passed out? Oh no, they can't survive? They can't survive? No, we're not gonna stop performing because somebody is unconscious in the audience. They just didn't survive the rage. When a kid passes out, it's not an emergency, it's just an opportunity for me to brand myself. Oh, you broke your hand? Let me celebrate you on my Instagram for not giving a f because that's what's most important, that you don't stop raging. One thing got a Travis Scott show, bro, you don't ever stop a fan from mother raging, bro. Even if the show gets out of control, even if you get hurt, you don't stop raging. You don't tap out. There is no going home, man. It's like, we're gonna spend the night and we're gonna party all the way to the sun goes up, right? At the end of the night, you should've been throwing up. You're supposed to get hurt at a Travis Scott concert because you don't just attend his shows. There's something that you gotta survive. Only some people are gonna make it through. Others aren't gonna be so lucky. But if you stick it out to the point where you black out, I will salute your bravery. If you kept raging until you're bleeding from your eyes, then I love you. And if you didn't survive the rodeo, but you tried, well, kid, then you're a hero in my book. All right, y'all, so by this point, we have covered a lot about Travis's past. We've talked about how he came up in music. We've talked about what his concerts are like and how he likes to rage. But now I wanna to turn to Astroworld. The Astroworld Music Festival was launched by Travis in 2018, which is the same year that he drops his album, which is also called Astroworld. The festival is named after this old Six Flags amusement park in Houston that was called Astro World that closed back in 2005, and the event was held at the location where this park used to exist. And so Travis wanted to bring back the spirit of this place that families used to love and have all these beautiful memories from. But just like concerts that he had done in the past, crowds got out of control. So here's the 2018 Astro World Festival, and you can see we have some crowd management issues, but look, this was the first year, and so maybe they were learning and they got it together the next year, so let's look now at 2019. Tens of thousands of people coming out to a sold out Astro World Fest. Some people though, too eager to get in, this Twitter user capturing this as the barricades outside the fest falling before the gates even open. Houston Fire telling ABC 13, Three people had to be taken to the hospital after getting hurt. And so after this happens, Travis makes an Instagram post where he could have told his fans, y'all, please don't break down security barricades. I know y'all are excited, but this was serious because people had to go to the hospital for this and we want everybody having a good time. We don't want people getting trampled. And you would think he might say this, especially after all the times that we know that people have gotten hurt and they've gotten trampled, they've gotten injured in out of control crowds at his concerts. But of course he doesn't discourage this, and instead he posts a video of the crowd breaking down the security barricade, and he writes, the youth dim control the frequency. Everyone have fun, ragers set tone when I come out tonight. So it doesn't help anything when Travis is posting things like this. It also doesn't help that this event, Astroworld 2019, reportedly the organizers were not as prepared and this event was not as staffed as it should have been. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> I was not ready for some of the stuff that happened at this event. So let's first talk about the GA line and what happened and caused that whole riot of people just coming in and just breaking through the fence and doing all those things. So if you look at the line right here, you can clearly see there were a lot of people everywhere trying to get in and it was 
pretty much ridiculous. That's right, there was no organization and nobody really knew what was going on, where to go, where to stand, how to get in. A few days after the festival, Travis also tweets, thank you to everybody that pulled up to Rage with a compilation video of clips of the crowd stampeding the security barrier, along with footage of crowds at his show getting out of control, raging and moshing, including a shot of an unconscious body being pulled from the crowd. And remember, three people had to go to the hospital for this. So once again, when somebody gets hurt at a Travis Scott concert, he uses that as promotional content. He is profiting off of people getting injured at his shows. And if you're sitting there like, girl, you're reaching with that one. Then let's fast forward to Astroworld 2021 because there is no Astroworld 2020 because of the pandemic. And so that brings us to 2021, the most recent Astroworld event. Y'all wanna know how the official Instagram account for the Astroworld Festival chose to market the 2021 event on the day that tickets went on sale for the festival? They shared the same clips of the out of control crowds at Travis's concerts, all the raging and the stampede back in 2019 where three people had to go to the hospital. So apparently this hyped people up to go because 100,000 tickets sold out in less than an hour, even though the lineup had not even been revealed. So fans were not happy about this and they were also not happy that the ticket price was super jacked up. So a general admission ticket went up from 179 bucks in 2019 to $300 in 2021, and that's not including $65 in fees. So in response to that, Travis posts on Instagram and he says, I'm putting a plan together now to get some more of the wild ones in. Even if I got to sneak them in, don't worry, I'm on it. Which honestly is messed up to the fans that have paid that expensive ticket price, which finances your luxury lifestyle for you to sneak people in who haven't paid, which makes the event more dangerous for everybody. So with all this going on before the Astroworld Festival even starts, the Houston police chief decides he's going to stop by and talk to Travis. He visits him in his trailer before the show on Friday, and he lets Travis know that he's concerned about the crowd's energy, and he tells him to be mindful of his team's social media messaging. He knew that our crowd was, you know, the type of crowd that comes, it comes at a heavy crowd. So to communicate with him if we were doing anything outside of the week's itinerary. That same day, early in the morning, people are already gathering outside the gates of NRG Park where the festival is held and they're waiting to be let in and right away things are already getting out of control. People are already piling in and causing crowd surge at the front gates. They're crowd surfing and they're throwing things and the Houston Fire Department logs note that the lieutenant is already requesting riot gear that early in the morning. So by the time the gates open, security stood no chance. The crowd starts flooding in in this huge mass, and they ain't worried about the barricades. From the moment the doors to Astro World opened, there was chaos at NRG Park, at dozens being trampled in the process. An attorney representing more than 150 people released what he says are internal Houston Fire Department logs, <laughs> stating security had lost control of the crowd early in the morning. By 10 a.m., there is a huge crowd in front of the merch stand. People are getting rowdy again, and that has to be shut down because things get so out of control. The fire department writes that participants were using bolt cutters to get into the concert. you got crowds rushing entrances throughout the day, and this Twitter user writes that it seems organized like a flash mob. And you got to wonder whether this was an organized effort because you got the founder of this festival and the star performer sitting there saying that he's putting together a plan to sneak the wild ones in. I probably saw 2,000 people sneak in with my, like, as I was waiting for merch at 9.30 in the morning. And so the crowd at Astroworld this day was never supposed to be this big. In the afternoon, fans are already packing themselves in front of the stage to get a good spot for Travis's performance, which isn't until 9 p.m., but it's already getting so crowded that some people are like, nah, I'm out. By 4 p.m., at least 54 patients had already been treated by medical staff, but the crowd keeps growing. They just pulled out like 50 people out of here, and the show has not even started. 
According to the event schedule, before Travis's performance, there were no other performances on the festival's second stage, which meant that all 50,000 people who bought tickets to the show could be gathering in front of that main stage in anticipation of Travis's performance. And as they're waiting, everybody's getting hype and everybody keeps pushing closer and closer to the stage. And there are more than just the 50,000 ticket holders who are here because the Houston Fire Department estimates that right before Travis takes the stage, there are about 55,000 people at the show, meaning that 5,000 extra people have snuck in because people keep coming over fences and barricades that have been compromised. As the sun is setting, people keep packing in and they're getting excited. And then finally, a giant countdown clock appears on the stage. As the timer got closer to zero, it got really, really bad. As soon as that countdown went to zero, it was just my, my rib cage was so squished that I couldn't expand my chest. At 9.02, Travis Scott pops up and everybody loses it. As soon as he jumped out and onto the stage, it was like an energy took over and everything went haywire. Was there a fight that broke out? I mean... No, it was just everyone rushing the stage to see Travis perform. As soon as Travis Scott started, all the flame, the fire, the phoenix and all that shit, and then he popped out, started going crazy. And like, I'm telling you, as soon as he started going crazy, like the whole crowd started raging and shit, everybody just screaming, help, help, help. All of a sudden, your ribs are being crushed. You have someone's arm in your neck. You're trying to breathe, but you can't. I literally like started having a kind of like a panic attack. I was so squished. I was like, like so compressed against people. It was just scary. Oh, 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 oh. She can't breathe. Nobody could breathe. People were bleeding out of their mouths and their nose, lips blue. Everybody around me was suffocating. We were standing on our tiptoes, and all you see is <gasps> everyone around you, chins up, <gasps> gasping for air, and that's all you see around you. Whenever he started performing, I looked at my boyfriend. I tried to look at my boyfriend, and we got about this far. And I told him, I said, I, we have to get out. We have to get out. And he said, we can't. We actually wanted to get out. Like the one of the girls I was with, she was like, hey, I don't want to do this, I want to get out. So we were trying to get out, but we just kept getting pushed forward and forward. You couldn't go forward, backwards, inside, you couldn't do anything. The only way to go was up. Once the crowd was moving, you were moving with it. There was no, there was, you were at the mercy of the crowd. The crowd started pushing, so people started falling. And in my head, I was just thinking, if you fall, you die. There's sinkholes of people in the crowds all around me. You couldn't even put your foot on the ground. I felt someone's chest. I felt someone's leg or a forearm. And unfortunately, I had to just step on anything I could or I was going to fall. Somebody left a f***ing shoe mark on my face from stepping on my face. Like, it was insane. The floors were covered in bodies. You're doing your very best. We're, we're fighting for our f***ing lives. I was fighting, I was fighting, and then I stopped because I, I, I was getting winded. I was using all the energy I had left in me, and, and I came to the point where I was accepting my death. As it went on, it got to the point where I was like, I'm going to die. I think it was, I don't even, I don't even remember what song was playing, I don't remember anything. I just know that he had just started, and I, uh, I fainted. They basically crowd surfed my unconscious body and then when i woke up again i was in a different part i was in like the vip area it's a vip section like different celebrities and people who pay like thousands of dollars to sit in the vip section mind you i'm pulling people out and i'm trying to pull them into that vip section that's where like people was pulling people in so they can breathe so the people in the damn vip section they getting mad talking about why the f you pulling people over here in our session i'm like man f this bro these people about to lose their motherfucking lives you know what i'm saying It was madness. It was madness. 
you had medical personnel who were not like trained or like prepared for what they were getting themselves into. They started trying to do CPR on someone. I said, you have got to check a pulse before you do CPR. If they have a pulse, you don't do CPR. You, you'll break ribs. I asked the security guard, I said, have you checked the pulse on this man? He said, I don't know how to do that. I mean, bro, like literally like it took the paramedics probably 30 minutes to get through. And once they got through, they tried to do CPR on her and nothing. Then they started carrying her out on a stretcher, bro. And they dropped the stretcher and her body, like just her lifeless body just topples over onto the ground again. I can't even, oh God, bro. Like I can't even. They didn't have enough Narcan for overdoses. They didn't have enough defibrillators for heart attack patients. There's reports of medical staff when they got to the scene of a body freezing up like deer in the headlights. At 928, the Houston Fire Department writes, this is when it all got real. So if people recording the concert, recording us doing CPR, recording the concert, dancing, and then meanwhile you have others that are climbing up the tower to the staff that's in charge of the lighting and saying, stop this, shut it down. I end up getting up on that stage and I'm trying to, I'm trying to like get Travis's attention and other people's attention. He's like telling us to get down. You can only help what you can see, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this night was just like a regular show, you know, it felt like to me. Get out the way, get out the way, get out the way. Get out the way, get out the way. What the is that? I'm just like, yo, is it an ambulance? It's like, what's going on? You know, I didn't get a response. It's an ambulance in the crow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I can name two specific instances when I had to open up a mosh pit solely to let an ambulance car cart come through. You know, security was trying to get to people they couldn't get to anyone because the crowd was entirely too big. I couldn't move my arm. So there was no way another body was getting in there. They were trying, but they couldn't. You actually see like the paramedics, like the car trying to drive through the crowd. And so he stopped the songs like shortly after. He noticed like some people were like passed out. He grabs everyone's attention by saying like, oh, put one middle finger up in the sky. If everybody good, put a middle finger up in the sky. Okay, where my guy, man? Come on. I asked everyone to put a hand up, and then, you know, didn't get a response from anything else, so just carried on. Right after that, he just continues to play. Y'all know what y'all came to do, Chase me, let's go. Whoa. I'm gonna make this mother ground shake, goddammit. Literally, you see like the cars just can't move because everyone just starts jumping. You see people climbing on top of the car and like they can't get nowhere because he just kept performing. It was so many bodies laid out. People was getting pulled out who was fainted. People was trying to medics were trying to give them CPR. And they was flipping them over and like they was literally turning them black and blue. Like I never seen no, I never seen death fucking like bro. I work in the hospital. I work, you know, people that go into cardiac arrest. I mean, this was more terrifying than anything I've ever seen. I saw people dying right in front of my eyes. Just by me alone, it was probably like 10 people laid out dead. I'm surrounded by unconscious bodies. I don't even know if these people were alive. There's. It just felt like we was like literally like in, in hell, bro. Like it felt like we was in a concert in hell. We were literally in hell. Like it felt like we were in hell. At 9.38, emergency officials declared the Astroworld Festival a mass casualty event, and the show's producer, Live Nation, agrees to cut the show short, according to ABC News, but that didn't happen, and Travis keeps performing. Oh, 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 oh. Let's play it slowly. We need somebody to help him. Somebody passed out right here. Somebody passed out right here. 
No, no, don't touch him, don't touch him. Everybody just back up. Security, somebody help jump in real quick. Keep going, just keep it this way. People were screaming bloody murder, literally begging for help from anybody. People were screaming help, trying to tell Travis, Travis Scott, they was like, help, the whole crowd was just going like, help, help, help. And he just kept going, bro. I just didn't, I just didn't hear that. You know, mm -hmm. I got music, I got my in-ears, but I just didn't, I just didn't hear that. You know, I just double checked, make sure everyone was okay. You know, I got a response that everyone was okay. Yeah. They're dragging dead bodies out of the crowd dead bodies and Travis knew. Travis had a bird's eye view on everybody and could see everything. He was asked multiple times to stop and his responses are, you know what you were here for, something like that, and let's rage. Y'all know what y'all came to do, Chase me, let's go. I wanna make this mother ground shake. You know, Travis acknowledged that something was happening in the crowd. He acknowledged that there was an ambulance, he acknowledged that someone was passed out and then just continued the concert. He just kept going, bro. That's scary, bro. It was so demonic, bro. I've been so heavily influenced by Travis, but like after tonight, bro, like he sacrificed so many people's lives tonight, like for real. I screamed for help so many times, alerted security, asked everyone in the crowd if there was anyone who was CPR certified. Every call went unanswered. I was told we already know and we can't do anything to stop the show because they're streaming live. Disgusting. At 9.54, surprise musical guest Drake appears on stage, and he and Travis perform together, and then Travis closes out the show on his own. Was there ever any, ever any communication to you on stage that you should end this? Well, yeah, I mean, they just told me right after, you know, the guests get, get off stage, you know, we're going to end the show. But it wasn't a communication on why, it was just, you know, that's what came through my ears, you know? Oh, so they didn't say stop now? No. Everybody, I love y'all. Make it home safe. Good night! It is around 10.15 when he ends his set, and by this point, it's been almost 40 minutes since Houston officials declared Astroworld a mass casualty event and since Live Nation had agreed to cut the show short. By the time Travis left the stage, Astroworld had become one of the deadliest concerts in U.S. history. Some 300 people were treated by medical personnel on site, authorities said, and another 25 were transported to the hospital. 10 people have died, the youngest nine-year-old Ezra Blount. According to ABC 13 Houston, Ezra was trampled and catastrophically injured at the concert. He was on his father's shoulders when the crowd surge began, and his father, Treston, passed out and fell, making Ezra fall along with him, and so he got trampled. His grandparents said they found him alone at the hospital in a coma, suffering from major organ damage and severe brain swelling. He was on life support for days before he finally passed away. If you want to help the people impacted by the Astroworld tragedy, then I've got a link down below in the description where you can donate to verified fundraisers on GoFundMe.com. So now that you have an idea how horrific it was and what happened the day of Astroworld, I wanna talk about what happened afterwards. First, let's talk about what Drake did. After Astroworld, sources say that Drake went to the strip club where he reportedly also dropped $1 million on the floor. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> Say thanks, Drake. Thanks, Drake. Kylie Jenner, who was at the concert that night, also posted a statement after the tragedy, writing, Travis and I are broken and devastated. My thoughts and prayers are with all who lost their lives, were injured, or affected in any way by yesterday's events. And also for Travis, who I know cares deeply for his fans and the Houston community. I want to make it clear, we weren't aware of any fatalities until the news came out after the show, and in no world would have continued filming or performing. 
Now, some people are saying that Kylie was lying about not knowing what was going on because earlier in the night, she had posted a story on Instagram showing an ambulance going through the crowd and then later she deleted it. As far as what Travis did after the show, he decided it was a good idea to go to Dave & Buster's, which is a restaurant slash arcade with a ton of games you can play. TMZ says that once Travis is told about the tragedy though, he immediately leaves the party. Some people seem to think that the fact that Travis went to Dave & Buster's after the show, that supports that he did not know, he legit did not know that there were deaths, he didn't know how bad it was when he left the concert because why would he go to Dave & Buster's otherwise? But I don't think that this necessarily proves anything. Concert organizers had already been told by officials earlier in the night that this was a mass casualty incident. So somebody should have told Travis, you know, what the severity of the situation was. And even if they didn't, you know, when he sees somebody who's unconscious being pulled from the crowd, when he sees an ambulance going through the crowd at his show, when he has to stop his concert three times for medical emergencies, then why in the world would he go to Dave & Buster's without first finding out, are those people okay? Like, it doesn't make sense, or it doesn't make sense for most people. But when you look at Travis's history and how he treats people getting hurt at his shows, he doesn't care. He's known about it, but he still, you know, posts about it. He still uses it to promote his brand. He still uses it to sell tickets at his concerts. And so to me, him going to Dave & Buster's, that just looks like par for the course where he knows somebody was severely hurt, but he, he, he doesn't care. When did you find out things got as bad as they did? Now that's that's the question everybody wants to know. Yeah, it wasn't really until like minutes until like the press conference until I figured out exactly what happened. You know, and at the thing is like, you know, people pass out, you know, people, you know, things happen at concerts, but something like that, it's just like. After Travis reportedly finds out how bad things were, he posts a video on Instagram talking about what went down at Astroworld. I just want to send out prayers to the to the ones that was lost last night. We're actually working right now to identify the families so we can help assist them through this tough time. You know my fans, my fans like my fans really mean the world to me and I always just really want to leave them with a positive experience. And any time I can make out, you know, anything that's going on. You know, I, you know, I just stopped the show and, you know, help them get the help they need, you know? Um, I could just never imagine the severity of the situation. Uh, we've been working closely, uh, we've been working closely with everyone to just try to get to the bottom of this, the city of Houston, HPD, fire department, you know, everyone to, you know, help us, help us figure this out. I'm honestly just devastated and, I could never imagine anything like this just happening. First of all, what is up with the rubbing of the head? The constant rubbing of the head is so weird. It doesn't seem natural at all. It seems to me like somebody who is trying to act devastated instead of actually being devastated. I mean, we saw, we heard from all of these people, these eyewitnesses, these people who were in the crowd, like we know how they were pouring their hearts out and like what their energy was this energy of pure shock, sadness, and devastation, like that is totally different than the energy that Travis has here. Second of all, the actual words that he's saying, these sound like his attorney and his crisis PR person sat down, had a little powwow, and wrote out a script for him. They're like, okay, first you gotta say that you're gonna help out the families, right? So Travis says, we're working to identify the families so we can assist them through this tough time. That doesn't sound conversational. It doesn't sound from the heart. It sounds like you were given a script. Then he says, he always stops his show to make sure that a fan who's in trouble can get the help they need. Well, we know that this ain't true. We know that there are multiple times when he has not stopped his shows in the past. And we also know he didn't do that this time because he did not stop the show long enough for people to get the help that they needed. And then lastly, he says that he is working with officials to, to get to the bottom of it, to figure out what happened. And he's lumping himself in with this side that is, is really the heroic side, the fire department, the police department, who were trying to make sure that this event was under control and safe when they're seeing the Astro World account. And Travis share this video of the security barricades getting knocked down. They're saying that they're gonna sneak the wild ones in. He has not been on the side, you know? He has been on the other side causing the issues and now all of a sudden he does wanna be on their side and we're just gonna to try to figure out what happened. I have a responsibility to, 
To figure out what happened here, I have a responsibility to figure out the solution. And this feels very calculated to me. It feels like he wants people to think this is some mystery that we have to figure out, that we have to solve. Instead of thinking that it could be, bro, you should have stopped the show and you didn't because you were greedy. Now, Travis's attorney says he didn't know how bad things were and he could not have known. Truly, he did not know what was going on. As you could see from the clip right there, he's on a riser at one point and he sees one boy down and he actually asks security, he stops the show, he asks security get, to get to that person. But understand that when he's up on the stage and he has flash pots going off around him and he has an ear monitor, he can't hear anything, he can't see anything. I feel like this attorney wants to have his cake and eat it too because you know he wants to use the argument that Travis couldn't see, he couldn't hear from up there, so he couldn't have known what was going on. But he also wants to use the argument that Travis did stop the show, you know, he tried to help, but that also means so he could hear, he could see, he could have known. And I, I think it's a hard sell that you want to try to have it both ways. The other problem with that argument is that there are so many examples of other musical artists who took way more effort to stop their shows to make sure that their fans were safe. Yo, 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 everybody calm down. Everybody back up. Back up! Just pick those girls up, bro. Pick the girls up! Pick the f***ing girls up! What's wrong with y'all stupid Pick the girls up! Hold on a minute. Hey, cut that s*** out. You don't come to a show and fight people. God damn. Somebody come over here and take this man outside. I'll give you your money back. Ain't nothing you can do about it now. You're going to have to go. Yeah, that fella right there. She passed out? She passed out. Hold on. We can all need water. Can you get her up? Is she OK? No, I'm on the floor. Are you all OK? Jesus. Yes. yes. Are you good? Are you good? Are you all good? I love Jesus, you so I love much. much. I care about you guys so much. I need you to be okay. Yo, yo, paramedics! Somebody's having a seizure. We need paramedics. Yo, call paramedics. Come on. Then the performer here, Little Pump, waits until the fan who's having the seizure is safely pulled from the crowd, and afterward, he leaves the stage to go with the fan to make sure that they're getting the care they need, and only then does he come back, give the thumbs up, and continue his show. Yo. We got a little problem Pick up here. Up. Pick them up right Everybody now. Everybody up. When someone falls, what do you do? We got to look out for safety first, for real. Nobody gets hurt. That's hey, number yo. one. So while other artists are saying that the number one thing is that nobody gets hurt at our concerts, Travis is writing lyrics like this. And it ain't a mosh pit, if it ain't no injuries, I got him stage diving out the nosebleeds. And so this is how Travis treats injuries at his shows. He expects them, he celebrates them, and he markets himself with them. So it's no wonder he didn't stop the show just because his fans were getting hurt. The Travis Scott show wasn't the bottom line factor of what happened here, you know? something to happen here, you know? And that's why we want to fix it, because it can happen anywhere. Next, I want to look at the operations plan. This is a 56-page document that was made for the Astro World Festival by organizers as a guide for running the event. So first of all, I am a little concerned that we have some key information missing here. So we've got, for all event operations, the festival is supposed to maintain an event control center. Located, we're not sure. Phone number's also TBD. Then we've also got a command post handling emergency incidences and directing response and recovery, very important, but we don't know how to call them either. The designated areas of refuge are to be determined, and should the need arise for a total evacuation, then staff are going to marshal at the area located to be determined. Now, I don't know if this was a working draft or if this was the final version, in which case that would be very concerning, but this operations plan document was shared by several reputable news sources, and I didn't see that any of them said this was not the final version, but I'm not sure. It is a little weird though that there was apparently a lot of contact information that was filled in because it was redacted when it was released by the news media. Now, if you look at who was in charge of this festival, you'll see that we've got roles and responsibilities and we've got contacts listed for the director of risk and safety and the director of security, but no names listed for the executive producer or festival director, which is a little weird. And that's also concerning because these two unknown individuals were the only two people, according to this document, that had the authority to stop the show. No, wait, maybe it was three individuals, because I see three bullet points here under the following individuals have the authority to shunt show power in order to facilitate an evacuation, but there are no names listed. 
Now there was in fact in this operations manual an evacuation protocol. So here's the script telling people how to go to the nearest exit. They could have read this, but they didn't, even though officials declared it a mass casualty event. So I'm not sure what other threshold they were waiting to cross before they thought, okay, we need to go into evacuation mode. So then let's look at what organizers plan to do if there was a mass casualty event, also known as an MCI. Incident Command will establish communications even though the phone number for Incident Command is to be determined. And we've got instructions for how to triage for people who have been injured and how to get people to the hospital. But there's no bullet point here that says we need to stop the show and we need to evacuate everybody so there's no more deaths. Instead, the biggest type that I found in this whole document was right here. It says all efforts should be made to not panic spectators. Let the event continue if a threat is not in their area. And now we come to this footnote, which says that if event organizers suspected that there was a deceased victim, they were not supposed to say dead or deceased over the radio. Instead, they were supposed to use the code word Smurf. And if you don't know what a Smurf is, then it's this imaginary character that has blue skin and the skin of someone who's died can also have a bluish hue. When I read this, I mean, th this is beyond disgusting. You should treat the possibility of somebody attending your concert getting killed with ultimate seriousness. You should have this reverence for that possibility. The last thing you should be doing is comparing that to a cartoon character. I think it says everything about how the concert organizers felt about the lives of the concert goers. An attorney for one of the victims says, there's every indication that the performers, organizers, and venue were not only aware of the hectic crowd, but also the injuries and potential deaths may have occurred. Still, they decided to put profits over their attendees and allowed the deadly show to go on. Next, I want to talk about security at the event. The operations plan says the festival employs experienced, licensed event security. But an investigation by a local TV news station found that was not entirely true. So even though some of the security personnel were licensed, not all of them were. The head of risk management for security personnel, and let me just tell you about this role. This is the person who is in charge of directing all security operations for the festival, responsible for all aspects of festival safety and security. Big deal, lots of responsibility. That person is not licensed as a private security officer in Texas and is not licensed as an officer of the peace in Texas. Besides that person, three other security directors at this Astroworld Festival are also not licensed as either one of those. Besides those individuals, the company that all of these four security directors work for is not licensed with the state's private security database and that company's website is no longer active. So I am sure you're not surprised to hear that the festival producer Live Nation has faced previous lawsuits and fines for unsafe conditions at concerts before. Security guards are jointly suing, accusing Travis and organizers of putting greed before safety at the festival. And we are now learning that a man hired to work security for the event says he quit that morning over concerns of lack of training and staffing issues that made him question his own safety. The day of, I know that there were several other people that said that they wanted to walk out and leave. I had overheard some other people, you know, mentioning online and in person that there was a plan to storm the gates. And I mentioned that to my superiors, but it seemed like it fell on deaf ears. And you have to wonder whether that had something to do with Travis, because he's saying that he's putting together a plan to sneak the wild ones in. And so I'm telling you, if I was an attorney on one of these lawsuits, and I'm not an attorney, so maybe this is a dumb idea, but I feel like I would be looking to see whether there is a digital trail between Travis to concert organizers and staff down to these gate crashers. This, this is all just seems really sus to me. One concert goer saw a mob as he's heading to the concert grounds, and he says, there's the mob right before we got in. I know. We're not a part of that Why is the security guard telling a concert goer who's concerned don't even worry about that mob. You said there's not much training. What were the job requirements for this? Uh, you do have to take a state licensing exam for a level two security officer. However, the training for that was extremely brief. It was an open book test. Uh, the teacher, he was actually giving us the answers. This was the night before Astroworld and it was already approaching 11 p.m. 
Now, two other security officers who were hired to work at Astroworld said they also were not trained, and then they wound up totally unprepared and having to pull dead bodies from the crowd, and they said the company that hired them never checked their background, never checked their credentials, never checked their licenses. We didn't show any. I didn't, feel, I didn't even show my ID. They told us to show up in all black, and that's what we did. As far as training, there was no training. Next, I want to talk about the government oversight of Astro World. So the festival organizers did file permits with the city and county for things like closing roads, serving food, and shooting off fireworks. But the morning of the concert, a chief from the fire department stops by the festival site because, you know, he wants to get a lay of the land because he's responsible for making sure that there are enough emergency services available, but he is denied access. We're told that they didn't have jurisdiction and that uh, that was being handled by private medical. After he's denied access, he asks to speak to the head of security, who you would think would be like, yes, of course, I want to give you access to the site because, you know, we're both working together to make sure that the event is secure because I am the head of security. But no, it is reported that he also denies the chief access and the fire department chief was given a map instead. If we're trying to go in and have an idea of where things are, uh, that's because we, we care about the people that are there. So the Houston Fire Department was trying to get ready so that they could keep this event safe, but organizers are getting in the way. The Houston Police Department was also trying. Remember, you've got the chief of police stopping by to personally meet with Travis because organizers are posting foolishness online that is the opposite of security. Another major roadblock that organizers put up had to do with communications. When you have an emergency at a giant event like this, it is very important that you can communicate quickly, and that ain't gonna happen with a cell phone. When you've got an event with 55,000 people, good luck trying to make a call. And so that's why concert organizers wrote in their operations plan that they would only rely on cell phone communication as a last resort. Instead, it's common practice for festival organizers to use radio communications, which is what they plan to do based on their manual, so that they could address emergencies ASAP. But despite that, the news reports that the Houston firefighters had no radio contact with Astro World Medics. The president of the city's firefighter union told CNN that the department had asked the organizers to provide a radio to communicate with the festival medics, but... Instead of giving us a radio, uh, I'm told that they were given a list of cell phone numbers. We were able to quickly respond as soon as, as we knew that the private company that was providing the, the medical component became overwhelmed. A tragedy like this that did happen, the responding agency uh, that has the resources and capabilities to treat and transport is going to be the Houston Fire Department. Getting them there quicker in the emergency response world is absolutely critical. Seconds matter. Lives matter. But I think the craziest part in all this is that, you know, officials say that they declared this a mass casualty event more than a half hour before the show actually ends. And they say that the festival organizers had agreed to cut the show short, but they just keep it going. And to me, that's the biggest problem here, because how is it that the people who stand to gain the most money by having this dangerous show continue, they're the only ones that have the authority to shut it down. Cities and counties should require anybody that wants to have some massive concert like this. And y'all remember, there were an estimated 55,000 people, and so many of them were really young. So anybody that wants to have a concert like this, first of all, a government official should be on site, and they should have access to that power switch and to the PA system so that they can shut the event down for the security of everybody there. It should also be required that, you know, the performer at the concert and the concert organizers and staff must fully cooperate in the event that the government officials decide they need to shut it down. Because can you imagine if police tried to get on stage and they're like, okay, we got to shut it down. And then Travis Scott was like, no, it'd be even more dangerous. And so they should be required to cooperate. And if they don't, there should be super, super stiff penalties. I mean, I'm talking about this should be serious felony because we've got human lives at stake here. We have long advocated that during events like this, we have Houston firefighters and paramedics on the inside. When these big productions are, ha are held in this venue, we want to be present and at the table from the beginning. You know, that's what I think should happen, but let's talk about what is actually going to happen to Travis Scott and to concert organizers in the aftermath of Astroworld. There are now over $3 billion worth of lawsuits after this tragedy, and I think that's appropriate. I think that the people behind this concert should have to pay after what happened. Now, Travis says he will offer refunds for everybody who came. He will also offer to pay for mental health counseling, which I think is the least he can do. I definitely don't think he should be walking away way richer because of those pricey ticket sales. 
Travis has also offered to cover the funeral costs for the victims killed at Astro World, but I personally don't feel like that's enough. Now, there are some attorneys who feel like it's unlikely that Travis is going to be held liable in these suits because it's gonna be difficult to prove that he's the one at fault. One attorney says the law requires him to engage in specific conduct that incited the incidents. What did he do at Astro World that night? Well, for one, he encouraged those gate crashers. So at past events, he had thanked them and put footage up of it. And that same footage was used to promote the event, to promote ticket sales. And then, you know, he's sitting there posting that he has a plan to sneak the wild ones in. And so he helped encourage these 5,000 extra unticketed fans who obviously don't care about security because they're knocking over barricades. And so to me, that shows very clearly he obviously does not care about security. And that's the key question here. One attorney says, if Scott actively disregarded known risks to his concert goers, either before the show or during it, he could be on the hook for negligence at the least. That attorney goes on to say that with the amount of damages that are being pursued in these suits, that could potentially bankrupt Travis. Now, even if Travis does not face financial liability in these civil lawsuits, he's definitely gonna be feeling some pain on the professional side. He already had to cancel an upcoming show in Vegas, and then he had to cancel another show in Saudi Arabia, which was gonna pay him $5.5 million, according to BET. And as far as brand deals, Look, Travis was really like a poster boy for celebrity brand endorsements. He had worked with McDonald's, Christian Dior, Hot Wheels. He's even got his own Reese's Puff cereal with General Mills. I mean, we're talking about some of the biggest companies in the world, and each one of these brand deals that Travis does is worth many millions of dollars. I mean, he's got so many brand deals, I'm sitting here wondering whether Kris Jenner is back behind the scenes making some calls, but she says she's not managing Travis, but anyway. After Astroworld, Travis is starting to get dropped by brands. Fortnite was featuring one of Travis's songs for a dance emote that it was selling in its item shop, but since Astroworld, the entire section of the shop that had had this dance emote in it has disappeared with no explanation. Nike, who's worked with Travis on several projects, said it's postponing the release of its latest shoe collab with Travis out of respect after Astroworld, which is fine because, I mean, these ain't that cute. Anyway, a PR expert said, you are witnessing the single most incredible brand hit to a music performer in modern American history. Travis is sitting on a powder keg that could see his empire go boom. Travis was also supposed to perform at the giant music festival Coachella, but a petition was created on change.org to remove Travis Scott from this concert and it got over 60,000 signatures. So now he has been dropped from the lineup that he was headlining. And so, of course, now Travis has decided that he wants to be the poster boy for improving concert safety. I want to see people really figure this out, not take this lightly, and really step up for the safety of concert goers. It's a little late for him to be saying that, if you ask me. But one thing it seems Travis can count on is YouTube revenue, because after fans went through what they describe as literal hell at his concert, if they share videos online showing their experience, or if commenters want to give opinions on what happened, and if a little bit of Travis's music is heard in the background, his record company is still filing copyright claims so that they can get the ad revenue, which lets Travis continue to profit after this tragedy. If you're a fan of Travis Scott, then there is a good chance you hate me right now, but I promise I did not make this video trying to cancel Travis or to come for Travis. Real talk, I barely knew who Travis was when I started this video, and honestly, I thought it was gonna be a 20 minute situation, but now here we are two hours later, thanks to the rabbit hole that is the internet. So in making this video, I have learned a lot about Travis, and I do wanna be clear, I know that Travis has made a really positive impact on a lot of people's lives. He's got a foundation called the Cactus Jack Foundation that has covered tuition fees for students to go to HBCUs, that has created community gardens and elementary schools, and that has donated tens of thousands of meals to folks in need in his hometown of Houston. He also appears to be a really great dad to his daughter Stormy, and obviously there are plenty of fans who've loved his music and who've had great experiences at his concerts. But despite all of that, after a tragedy like Astroworld, we gotta look back and think about how we got here. And honestly, if we look back at Travis's life, to me, there seem to be some really clear patterns that show who he is and what his character is. Remember, as soon as he leaves home, as soon as he sets foot outside that house, he starts stealing from his parents and lying 
talking to them about it. I wasn't wrong, man. Cause you know, it see is wrong in a in a sense, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> in the lyrics for Travis's song on your grave, he writes, This why I moved to Cali, stepped outside and got shaded for, told mama, get back in the door. Then once Travis moves to LA, we have two people saying that he stole music from the dude that let Travis stay on his couch. In his song called Bad Mood Shit On You that was on Travis's first solo mixtape that was released shortly after it is alleged that this theft took place, Travis writes, rob that dude, that couch. And look, I don't know for sure what he's talking about here, but I'm just saying this is suspicious, okay? And it's not like these allegations stop right after he moves to LA. They keep going throughout the years. Travis writes, I done things that most men would ask forgiveness. Who gives a f new children in the building? We ride with no limits. And if these allegations are true, then it seems like Travis did have no limits when it came to making sure he got rich and famous. And I think the saddest part is that even when Travis's fans got hurt, he didn't let that get in the way of his rise to the top. Even when kids passed out, even when a fan got paralyzed, even when people got trampled, and even when they were dying. It's crazy to me that a guy with this kind of history, with these kind of lyrics, managed to attract so many major brand deals. So many deals that he was called the brand whisperer. I mean, this was a dude who convinced McDonald's to collab on custom merch, including a $90 chicken nugget pillow and a custom meal at their restaurants. Restaurants that have built their entire brand around being family friendly with playgrounds and Ronald McDonald and Happy Meals with toys. So it's no surprise that two thirds of McDonald's Donald's franchise operators were against the idea of partnering with Travis because he writes songs titled Drugs, You Should Try It. He's gotten arrested for inciting riots at his concerts, and he uses injured kids to market himself. So, I mean, basically a perfect role model. But I guess it don't matter if he's a perfect role model or not because only eight days after McDonald's starts its custom Travis Scott meal, it started having ingredient shortages because the demand was so popular for this promotion. As long as the quarter pounders were flying out the kitchen, they didn't care what Travis did. People just looked the other way because Travis was making them coins. They helped him cheat because it was an industry standard, you know, and they made excuses for him. He wasn't a bad dude. He was just trying to win. And y'all, I know nowadays everybody acts like it's cool for somebody to be savage, but is it really? Do you really want to live in a world where everybody around you is lying to you, stealing from you, putting your life at risk, and they don't care, it ain't wrong, there are no limits as long as it's getting them ahead? Because I personally would rather live in a world where people are nice, where they don't steal my shit, and where they care whether I get trampled or not. I don't want to support somebody who stands for rage. Why would I want that? I want to support people who stand for love. I want those people to be the ones that get ahead in society. And if you agree with that, then make sure the people that you are following on social media, the people that you're giving your attention to, your money to, your respect to, make sure those are people who deserve it. People who are not going to be negligent with the power that you're giving them, but people who are going to really care about the well-being of others and who are gonna use that power for good. Y'all please give this video a like and a comment if you appreciated it. And if you wanna see more videos like this where I spill the tea on shady money makers, then subscribe to me here on the Guzzle channel and then we can hang out more. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye y'all.